All right, John, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be back. You know, we've done a few of these conferences now and it's, it's great timing for us because we're in a really active part of our exploration of the Soledad project. You know, we, we just uh, brought the second drill rig onto the property. Drilling has been going great. Uh, we've made several new discoveries, which I'll highlight today. Um, so it's, 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 it's really a great time to, to be talking about what we're doing on this project. In spite of all the challenges that we've had with COVID-19, uh, you know, we've been able to, to advance the project significantly. Uh, but today I, I'll give you a general overview like I always do on the company and, and on on our, our location being in Peru, and I'll talk about the copper uh, commodity, um, you know, forecast that, that we believe is going to be uh, really strong going forward. But I really wanted to focus the second part of the talk on, on aspects of the asset. You know, we, we've made a discovery. It's a really, really impressive discovery. But this, this discovery is going to get a lot bigger, and I'm going to go through the reasons why uh, we we know that because you know we we've demonstrated uh, six critical aspects of this discovery that are going to take it to a much higher level, and I think it's important for the investors out there to understand what those aspects are and how we're applying our knowledge of this new discovery to advance uh, to advance the the project. I will be making a number of uh, forward leading uh, statements, so please be forewarned about that. I've talked about this before. There's really four critical aspects of investing in any junior mining company, you have, to, you have to find a group that has a really strong management team with a proven track record. And, and I'll talk about that uh, with, with our board. Um, you got to have strong uh, shareholders and, and there's nothing better than having a cornerstone investor like a Goldfields, the seventh largest gold producer in the world. Um, you want your shareholders to have a long-term vision uh, of what your project can become. And we certainly have that in Goldfields and a number of other institutional investors that are uh, that are uh, shareholders of Chicana. You have to be in a great location, and I'm not just talking about uh, you know a place that supports mining. It has you know, minimal sovereign risk, but I'm also talking about the location with respect to infrastructure. If you're, if you make a discovery out in the middle of nowhere, uh, it, it may never become a mine in your lifetime. You know, we see lots of projects out. A lot of junior companies have great projects, but in really poor locations. So having, having a, a project in Peru, a mining country, in an active mining uh, province, uh, in an active mining district, we're in the Ancash province, it's just a great location. And then of course you have to have a good asset. And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. We've made a discovery. It's high-grade copper, gold, and silver. We get really spectacular grades in all three metals in different parts of the, of the deposit. And the upside potential is enormous. And that's really what the focus of, of the talk is today, is to take you through these six aspects that we think are really uh, fundamental to creating um, uh, huge wealth to our shareholders through maximizing the potential of this project. We are currently drilling. Uh, we have a 15,000 meter uh, drill program that was fully funded. We started it last um, last August and we've run that right into this year. And then this year we've approved a 26,000 meter drill program. Uh, so when you add up what we accomplished last year and what we're gonna drill this year, it's about 34,000 meters split between resource definition drilling and exploration. And in the last uh, six months, we've made three new discoveries on top of four previous discoveries on the property um, that we had made. So the project is going really, really well, and we're really excited to continue uh, with the even more aggressive drilling program this year with the second drill rig uh, just uh, arriving on the property over the weekend and starting, uh, it started drilling yesterday, and it's just about to finish its first hole. So, you know, if you look at this project that we have, uh, given its location, given the fact that it's in an active mining district. The infrastructure is outstanding. This is the kind of project that can be fast tracked. And again, there are there are a lot of uh, interesting projects out there. But when you really look at how long is it going to take for that asset to become a producing mine, um, you know, you have to factor in all the other other aspects of the mining project, including its location, including its support with the local communities, and that and that uh, uh, part of the uh, part of the equation. So I'll talk about that as we go through this uh, presentation.
Our share structure is shown here. Um, you know, Goldfields now sits at, at just right under 20%, 19.99. They started off at 16.8 and they've moved to 19.99 just based on the results. You know, they're super excited about uh, the project. So it's it's great for us to have a, a strategic investor like Goldfields. Um, they're, an, they're a shareholder of the company. They have no future rights on the asset, uh, but they obviously like what we're doing and they like the way the project's uh, advancing. Institutional and shareholders include uh, U.S. Global, two different funds there, Sprott Asset Management, OSISCO, um, and it, it will, we'll be bringing a number of additional institutional groups in um, in the financing uh, that that we're um, that we're working on. We also have a significant number of uh, high net worth individuals that, again, experienced mining investors, and they like what we're doing. Our uh, market cap is shown there, right at about 60 million. We currently have 9.3 million on hand, which is enough to get us through uh, this aggressive drill program and to get the first resource out this year, which is our goal. The board, uh, there's five board members at Chicana, and three of us are exploration geologists. I'm, I'm uh, shown in this photograph here with John Black and Doug Kerwin. Doug's our, our chairman. Doug is a recognized expert in these tourmaline breccia systems, which is the discovery we've made here. And that inside knowledge really gives us an advantage in how to explore this property. This is a property that um, I, numerous people have been to before. There were two prior drill programs before we got there. But the issue with terminally breccia pipes is that uh, they're not a well understood deposit type. And, and you know, many, many economic geologists have, have stood on the same outcrops that we stood on when we were looking at the project. And I, I first visited the project back in 2011 when I worked for MMG. And, you know, they didn't see the potential. They didn't realize that these small breccia outcrops were very vertically extensive. You know, we don't, we've never seen the depth of one uh, of, of a breccia pipe yet, and we've drilled 900 meter holes on the property. So, you know, people couldn't couldn't appreciate what the upside potential was, and that's really what we brought to the table. We're doing something different based on a, a, a different understanding of these mineral systems than other companies have. John Black is a uh, is a very successful economic geologist and CEO. He was previously the CEO of Antares. They made a very big discovery uh, in southern in Peru, the Hakira deposit, they divested that asset to First Quantum for $657 million uh, back in 2000, 2011. And that's really what our model is with Chicana. It's to focus on a single asset, advance that discovery to the point that the asset's ready to uh, develop and then divest that asset in the hands of a, of a developer that will come in and build a mine. Our project is shown uh, here in Peru. It's it's just north of central Peru. It's in the Ancash province. It's uh, just 65 meters west of Antimina, which is Peru's largest mine. It's the largest operating mine in Peru. It's about 35 kilometers south of uh, the Piarina mine, which was mined by Barrick, uh, a world-class gold mine. And we're really in the same rocks and the same geology as the Piarina deposit. As John mentioned, we're in the Miocene mineral belt. Uh, we're in the Cordillera Negra. It's a it's a, it's a it's a very prolific mineral belt in Peru. It's one of the greatest endowed uh, mineral belts on the planet. And you can see there a number of uh, we're just showing um, you know a high level uh, summary of of the of the big deposits that are in the Miocene belt. Um, they stretch all the way the entire length of Peru. And if you put all of the smaller mines on there, the the the, the map would be so dense with with uh, with symbols you wouldn't even be able to see any of the features of uh, of the Miocene belt. So it really is a very uh, prolific mineral belt. It's a great place to be. Uh, within that, we're in an active uh, district. It's called the Aija Tika Pampa district. There's four active mines and two processing plants within uh, that district. And so being in, in this, in this uh, province where two world-class mines have already been uh, discovered and built and operated. The infrastructure is outstanding in terms of uh, access to grid power, uh, mostly uh, powered by hydroelectric uh, energy and uh, road networks and access to water and access to skilled labor in the, in the regions around these operating mines. 
Uh, Peru is uh, currently the second largest uh, uh, copper, global copper producer and the second largest silver producer. It's also the, the largest gold producer in Latin America, and it attracts a huge amount of foreign investment in, uh, in mining. And you can see there, after uh, Peru sits uh, in the fifth place after Canada, Australia, U.S., and Chile. So um, it is a preferred destination for foreign investment in mining. Um, mining forms a very significant part part of the GDP of of Peru, you can see there about uh, 13 percent, and uh, even now, um, it's even though mining has uh, has had uh, setbacks with related uh, in relation to the pandemic, uh, mining is the one industry that's that's keeping the pulse, uh, the economic pulse of, of Peru alive. Uh, there are other significant contributions to GDP or travel, um, uh, the travel industry, tourism, and uh, agriculture, and of course, those have been really hit hard by the pandemic. But mining. Has has been able to uh, to kind of keep the 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 uh, the industry going and keep the economy of Peru operating. The the view on copper and one of the reasons we we focused on copper when we created uh, Chicano it, it's because of this really it's a, the fundamental forecast for copper is really outstanding and it's it's been a um, it's it's the. The supply gap that's shown in those graphs on the right have, have been developing for quite some time. And it really goes back to the fact that the industry as as a as an entire industry is under invested in, in finding new copper resources. So a lot of the major companies, the major mining companies have under invested in exploration. They've had the attitude that we'll buy out the juniors when they go find the copper deposits. But the problem is the copper deposits are harder to find. And uh, we see that everywhere on the planet. It's, it's largely related to exploration maturity. The easy deposits have been found. Uh, the more difficult deposits are often uh, uh, you know, conceptual in nature, they're deeper. Uh, the exploration technology that you apply to find deposits uh, is is more challenging and less certain. So uh, it, you, you, you can see if you look at discovery rates, they have dropped off in the last couple of decades. Um, you combine this with the fact that a lot of the mines are going out of production or their head grades are dropping. There's uh, there's numerous disruptions that we see across the planet in copper production, and this is uh, related to, um, you know, it's related to weather events, it's re related to things like the pandemic, it's related to uh, labor issues, a number of different disruptions. So you you create this this uh, problem where your your production is decreasing while your demand is increasing, and this is all before we even start talking about things like green energy, okay, and er uh, global urbanization. And the the proliferation of electric vehicles, which the U.S. has now joined in that challenge to electrify the vehicle fleets, um, and that's going to create massive demand for copper. In fact, if you if you follow Robert Friedland, he was just recently quoted as saying, "Forget about the supercycle. Everyone's starting to talk about supercycles again, and whether or not we're on the verge of the next supercycle." He said, "Forget supercycle." He said, "This is going to be bigger than anything we've ever seen before." When the green energy and the global urbanization hits, uh, the demand on copper is going to be enormous. The effect of COVID-19 on Peru has been really devastating, and, and, and we saw that um, initially, you know, er efforts were made to, to really lock down Peru and try to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. But eventually, you know, it, it, it the, the lockdowns were not successful. Um, it had to do a lot with the poverty level of Peru. A lot of people don't even have refrigerators, um, so they can't go to a market and shop and 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 do that every two weeks. They have to they have to go to the markets on a frequent basis, and it's it really has been devastating to uh, to the people of Peru and to the economy. We've had numerous um, uh, efforts over the last you know ten months to reach out to. Uh, to the local communities that that we work with, together with Goldfields, we've we've had um, uh, made numerous donations of medical uh, supplies and equipment, uh, masks, gloves, cleaning supplies, of uh, food. Uh, we're doing a second round of that now because the second lockdown is in progress. So um, it has had a, a a significant impact. But I guess the saving grace 
for the mining industry is that um, the government recognized that the mining industry was the one industry that uh, they could restart, that could create um, uh, jobs, that could uh, continue to provide investment into uh, communities and investment into Peru. And so they were allowed, they allowed the, the largest mines to restart. They allowed the medium and smaller mines to restart. They allowed exploration to restart. So uh, we were fortunate to be able to be part of that and we were able to start our drill program in August of last year and continue that um, to today. So moving on to the second part of this talk, I'm really going to talk about what we think is uh, really exceptional about the discovery we've made. It's the kind of things that when we step back and look at the the big picture of what this project can become, it really comes down to these uh, six aspects. They're all technical in nature. I mean, obviously the location of the project is important. The, 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 the management team is important. Um, but w on a technical level, these are the things that really uh, that really drive where we see the, the value creation and, and the ability to take the discovery that we've made into a tier one asset. And we fully believe that we can reach that that uh, reach that level. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is just the footprint of the mineral system. And mining companies use this as a gauge for how big your mineral system can become. Um, there's lots of ways of doing this. You can measure it looking at a lot of different things. Some people simply apply mineral occurrences. Where do you see this mineral? For us, the critical mineral is tourmaline. Tourmaline is the mineral that indicates um, the 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 size of the uh, intrusive system that sits beneath the deposits that that created the the mineralized breccia pipes and so the map on the right shows uh, all of those red symbols are where we find tourmaline mostly tourmaline breccia sometimes we see tourmaline as replacement along structures and that type of thing densely altered rock uh, but that's the footprint of our system as defined by tourmaline it's about four kilometers and a north northeast by uh, three kilometers uh, perpendicular to that and that's a very very big footprint okay porphyry systems often have footprints on the order of of tens of kilometers the alteration around a porphyry system can be absolutely enormous so depending on how you measure it um, will tell you uh, how big the mineral system is for us we use tourmaline as a as a footprint because that's within the area that we expect to make discoveries and we've already found numerous um, uh, uh, breaches within this area that crop out at surface. We've also found blind breaches within this uh, within this area, and we know that that's going to continue. So the footprint of the system of the Soledad system is huge, and we expect that that's going to uh, continue to show us where the uh, where the breccia pipes are. We have a short video here I'd like to bring in and it'll emphasize uh, uh, this aspect of uh, the footprint, but also the number of breccia pipes. And that's the second theme of what I wanna talk about is how many breccia pipes could be in this deposit. We know that there's already 23 breccia pipes um, that we can stand on. They're, they crop out at surface. There's another dozen really strongly altered areas where we can only see uh, that kind of alteration immediately proximal to the breccia pipe. So that's, you know, another dozen on top of the, on top of the, the, the 23. And then we have blind breccia pipes. And when you put all of that together, the number of, the total number of breccia pipes that could be on this project, it could be in the hundreds. Um, there are good examples of many tourmaline breccia pipe districts that have greater than 100 breccia pipes as part of the, as part of the district. Um, so we know that that's a, a possibility. John, I'm not sure if you can queue up that video. Um, be nice to start that. We'll start off. Those are all the tourmaline occurrences. Again, we're kind of looking at the north part of the property. You can see on the south, there's a number of other tourmaline occurrences. The tourmaline occurrences that we've drilled have turned into these uh, these breccia pipes, which we're now showing. These are three-dimensional models of the breccia pipes. Uh, there's numerous breccia pipes and all of our press releases talk about the drill results in these different breccia pipes. More recently, we've been exploring on the, on, the, on the lower part of the mountain there. You can see there's three breccia pipes. Um, that's the Paloma discoveries we've made uh, since August. And then at the very bottom of the hill is the Juan Carama discovery. These are all new discoveries. Uh, we've hit lots of high grade in all three of these breccia pipes. 
you can see that they're vertically extensive. Um, the really big pipe you're seeing there on the right, that's Paloma East. It's got a very small uh, outcrop at surface, only 25 meters in diameter, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger at depth. And that's another theme I'm gonna be talking about. There's a very high grade smaller pipe right beside it. It's the Paloma West uh, discovery, and that obviously needs to be extended at depth, but it's not hard to imagine that if we extend that to depth, it's gonna run right into the Paloma East. Um, this is Juan Karama now that we're, we're zooming in on. You can see there's two smaller breccia pipes that come to surface, but they coalesce at depth. It's another theme I'm gonna talk about, the breccia pipes coalescing at depth, creating a much larger breccia system. And this breccia is already about 60 by 100 meters. It's one of the biggest breccias we've seen on, on the property to date. So now as we zoom back out, we're going to overlay the soil geochemistry and show the gold enrichment in soils. And gold in tourmaline occurrences is really our two primary uh, techniques for showing us where the growth of this mineral uh, system is going to occur. Look at all the anomalous gold and tourmaline breaches on on the western side of the project where we haven't even drilled yet, and then on the south side of the project. The upside potential is really enormous when you look at it through the lens of these of, the, of, of a footprint and the total number of retro pipes that could be on the project. Thank you, John. Now, I mentioned blind breccia pipes. One of the interesting things about these breccia pipes is these are not volcanic features. These are not breccia pipes that erupted at surface and created more of a, a outward flaring diatreme type of geometry. These are breccia pipes that erupted on top of a, of a crystallizing magma at depth, and they broke a column of rock vertically until they ran out of energy, and there were still probably two kilometers of rock above the breccia pipes. And the only reason we're seeing these breccia pipes at surface today is because of the erosion of that two kilometers has exposed some of the breccia pipes, but not all of the breccia pipes. And we know that because early in our, in our maiden drilling program in 2017, we were drilling the breccia one, an outcropping breccia pipe. We now call it the main zone. And we let a drill hole run out to the north. It was about hole number seven in our initial drill program. And we clipped another breccia about 40 meters to the north and 125 meters below surface. And that intercept had 13 meters of 12% copper equivalent. It was really stunning mineralization, but we couldn't understand why it was so far outboard from the main zone. And as it turns out, it's a blind breccia pipe. And you can see in the cross section on the right, we now have multiple drill holes into that breccia pipe it's immediately next to the main zone but it doesn't come to surface and we've even drilled right over the top of it we see alteration but we don't see breccia and that's one of the clues that we now use for predicting where we might have other uh, blind breccia pipes but i can tell you this if we have one blind breccia pipe on the property there are going to be numerous breccia pipes it's just a fortunate uh, fact of nature that the erosion level wasn't deep enough to completely erode all the breccia pipes or high enough to where we didn't even see any of the breccia pipes. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a stroke of luck that we have this erosion level that's preserved most of the vertical extent of these breccia pipes. All right, moving on to number three, vertically extensive uh, breccia pipes. And we know this because we've done some deep drilling at the property. We've drilled 900 meter holes. And the cartoon on the left shows what we think the geology looks like. The breccia pipe is the, is the red, uh, the very tall columnar feature. Again, it's getting uh, it's, it's a narrow feature. It comes to a point at surface. If we show the entire breccia pipe there that hadn't been eroded, it would have come to a point. And we know that because we can, we've got multiple examples of what the tops of these breccia pipes look like. But they do get bigger at depth and they're vertically extensive. In fact, we've never seen the bottom of a breccia pipe. And on the, on the right side of that diagram, you can see those numbers represent the depth that we've been able to track the breccia 
from surface. So in Breccia 6, we have mineralized Breccia going down to 824 meters. We've drilled uh, uh, from surface to 490 meters on Breccia 1, and the Breccia pipe is still open at depth. In fact, we've never seen uh, the uh, higher temperature form of alteration. We call it potassic alteration. We've never even seen that yet in these breccia pipes. And we know as we get deeper, the system will get hotter. It's getting closer to the heat source, and we should see a transition into this higher temperature mineral assemblage. We haven't seen that yet. So vertical extensive nature of breccia pipes is, um, is a really important feature because as they continue at depth, we're adding tons, right? So uh, that's a really important uh, way of, 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 of adding, adding tons to the overall resource. And again, this is looking at um, that same image that we saw in the video, vertically extensive um, uh, breccia systems, and many of them uh, still needing a lot more drilling to take these uh, breccias at depth. The other aspect, and I've already touched on this, the breccia pipes get bigger at depth, and it's a function of how they formed, okay? Um, the fact that they started off, um, the size of the breccia pipe at depth probably relates to the size of the of the intrusion, not the big giant intrusion that we think has this four by, th four by three kilometer footprint, but smaller cupolas, smaller intrusions that came off of the bigger intrusion where the volatiles accumulate. And it's really the, the accumulation of volatiles that uh, ultimately explodes and creates this broken column of rock above the intrusion. And so the, the size of the base of the breccia pipe is probably related to the size of that cupola. But what we see is that as we go deeper, the size of the breccia pipe gets bigger. And that's another great feature when you think about it. If the breccia pipes are vertically extensive and they're getting bigger at depth, then again, your tons are going to continue to add up. Here's a great example. We saw that in the video on the right, Paloma East, 25 meters at surface, 100 meters below surface, it's 50 meter diameter, and another 100 meters below that, it's 100 meters diameter. Again, the size gets bigger at depth, and that's going to create a huge upside potential uh, for us. Um, now, this is something that we've speculated uh, for a long time. The fact that these breccia pipes may coalesce at depth, creating a much larger breccia body. It was it was speculation. Uh, we've now proven it. In our drilling at Juan Carama, you can see the map there. At Juan Carama, there's five principal breccia bodies at, at surface. And the idea was, well, maybe these are like the fingers on your hand. And as you go down, the fingers on the hand become the palm of your hand and they coalesce into one larger breccia system and that's exactly what we have on the eastern side where we've done the most drilling h1 and h2 two distinct breccia pipes cropping out at surface with volcanic rock in between so there's no volcanic there's no breccia in between those two but as soon as you go down about 100 meters those two breccia bodies coalesce into one very large breccia right now it's sitting at about 100 meters by 60 meters one of the largest breccias we've seen and if you've noticed our news releases as of late uh, we're hitting some very very high grades uh, particularly in the center uh, between those two uh, beneath that clap zone um, so this is a really really exciting feature for us because then you can step back and start thinking well where else does this occur and everywhere on the property where we see these clusters of breccia pipes um, the potential exists that these things are representing the vertical fingers on a much larger breccia system at depth. And uh, if, if we continue to chase these breccia pipes at depth, the, the upside potential again, it's enormous. Here's another great example of what we think is, is indicating coalescence of breccias at depth. Breccia 5 and breccia 6 are two well-mineralized breccia pipes. They were two of our earlier discoveries. Lots of drill results uh, published on these two discoveries. And the breccia pipes sit about 550 meters apart at surface. But as you can see in that cross-section, as we go down, breccia pipe 5 starts to migrate to the north, and there's a deeper breccia at 6, that is moving south. And the distance between, the separation between those two breaches at depth is only 340 meters. So they've come together uh, 210 meters closer than they are at surface. And so what happens in the next 500 meters depth extent? Do they come together into one much, much larger breccia system? We don't know, but obviously that's 
Um, that's possibility based on what we've seen. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is is a, is a unique feature we see at at Soledad, and we have seen this in every mineralized breccia pie that's, that's, that carries copper grades. Uh, we've seen it in shallow examples, we've seen it in deep exa examples, and it's this late stage copper replacement, and it's really impressive. It creates some very spectacular grades. And you can see in, in, in the top two core pieces there, that's one drill hole, okay? That's a, a piece of drill core at 417 meters depth in breccia five, and the same drill hole at 478 meters depth. And what you see in the first uh, picture on the left is that all the copper, all of that gold shiny uh, metallic mineral is chalcopyrite. It's a, it's a mineral with about 34% copper. And all the chalcopyrite sits in the matrix of the breccia. So you can interpret this two ways. You could say, well, that's that's uh, sulfide cementing the broken rock. It's just like a cement inside the matrix, uh, cementing the class, or it's come in and it's selectively replaced the matrix, but not the class, okay? If you go deeper, you can see the entire rock is being wiped out by chalcopyrite. It's being replaced, and you can still see the breccia texture. You can see the fragments. You can see the matrix, and it's completely wiped out. That's happening inside the breccia pipe, and we've seen that, as I mentioned, in, in essentially every single breccia pipe that we've drilled. What's really impressive is we also see that process happening outside the breccia pipes. And we've never even focused on drilling what's outside the breccia pipe. It is another, it's probably number seven on the list of, of uh, upside potential at Soledad. What's happening outside the breccia pipes? And we can see these are two drill holes that sit in a pre-mineral intrusive rock it sits in between the two breccia pipes at one, the blind breccia pipe and the main breccia pipe. And this is a rock that's been heavily mineralized by this late stage copper replacement. And it's not just copper, you can see there, there's five meters, including some massive sulfide on the right with 4.6 grams gold, 5% copper and 275 grams silver and 30 meters away in the same rock, there's another zone of replacement mineralization with 2.7 gold, 2.2 copper and 1100 grams silver. So again, really spectacular grades in all three of these uh, minerals. So I wanna close the talk um, by bringing back the mining aspect. Um, I've talked a lot about the upside potential. The question I, I get all the time is, is what's, what's, uh, how are you gonna get the metal out of the ground? How are you gonna mine this? And the, the mining method that I've had three different mining engineers look at, uh, look at the project, including gold fields, and they all agree, it's sub-level mining. It's the most common underground mining technique globally. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very conventional technique, and you can get some significant tons out of sub-level mining. Uh, Cerro Lindo uh, by Nexa in Peru, they mine with this technique 20,000 tons per day. In our case, we've got multiple mineral deposits. They're individual breccia pipes. So you can envision a mine where you have multiple breccia pipes in production, uh, multiple zones within a breccia pipe. So you have ultimate flexibility in the production rate, in the amount, the ability to blend your ores, to uh, control head grade, for example, in the plant. Uh, you've got elevation working in your favor, so you don't have to develop expensive tunnels to get underground. I mean, expensive shaft, vertical shafts. You can come in uh, with low cost development of, of tunnels to access multiple breccia pipes. Um, the, the mining engineers love this project because it's flexible and um, it, there are so many things that are working in the favor of developing underground. Now, I will say that some of the, some of the grades and extent of mineralization we've drilled recently, a Paloma and Juan Carama, um, potentially can bring in the idea of open pit mining. And that's another box that Goldfields wanted to check. Is there potential to start off some of these breccia pipes with, under, with open pit mining before you go underground? And so obviously we need to do a lot more work on that, but we're already kind of seeing the footprint of these breccia systems expand to the point where potentially open pit mining uh, could be a reality. So I want to bring this back uh, and summarize. You know, we, we, we're working towards our first resource this year. And that resource is going to be based just on a few breccia pipes, probably six, maybe seven breccia pipes. And it's only going to touch the top uh, 300 meters because that's the 
that's the depth that your surface drilling can really be effective in creating the density of drilling that's needed to get to a resource. Uh, but we know they're vertically extensive. We know they're getting bigger at depth. We know we're going to find more breccia pipes. So the, the, the question is how big can a deposit like this be? Uh, it's going to grow incrementally from our resource, uh, our initial resource estimate. But when you go back and you start doing um, uh, you know, calculations on the on the number of breccia pipes. What if we have 10 breccia pipes? What if we have 20? What if we have 30? What if we extend the mineralized extent from 300 to 600 meters? There's all kinds of upside potential here. But this could be uh, the kind of asset that has, uh, that will grow incrementally. It could potentially have 100 million tons in it. And it could have a grade of around 2% copper equivalent. That works out to be about a million tons of contained copper and over 3 million ounces of gold. That's the kind of potential that a big mineral system like this potentially could bring to the table. It'll require a lot of work, a lot of drilling to get there, but we're super excited about the potential here because we know that we're sitting on top of a large mineral system with a big footprint, with vertical extensive breaches, and we've only scratched the surface at this point. I'll leave it there, John. Thank you very much um, and happy to take some questions. All right. Can you see me and hear me again, Dave? I can. Okay, perfect. All right. So we'll start right off. Uh, you you kind of just mentioned it, talking about the resource estimate, but a few people asking when the resource estimate would be expected and why is it taking so long? Yeah, it's, you know, we, we had a number of delays um, with the permit. Uh, you know, obviously for us, we want to put out a, an initial resource as material. And by material, I mean something that's going to be a mine in Peru. And, you know, Peru, as I mentioned, it's a great, it's a great mining country. And if you, if you can, our target has always been 10 million tons of 2% copper equivalent uh, in the initial resource. Um, and, you know, that that's the reason we got delayed in that was because of a permit delay. But that delay is behind us now. We've got two rigs on the property. We're ramping up uh, the, the resource drilling so that we can get a resource out this year. We will have a resource out this year. Our target has been July. Um, you know, with the three new discoveries we've made at Paloma East, Paloma West, and Juan Carama, we want those to factor and feature into the resource estimates. So we may get pushed back a little bit. You know, it may fall into Q3, but it's going to happen this year. Okay. Uh, a question around the COVID situation. Are you able to continue the drilling program as planned? Are there any implications there for you? We are able to continue. I mean, it's fortunate that we put a camp in to the project uh, this year. That's another thing that that was another COVID measure that, that, that we, that we, uh, that we, action this year was to put our own standalone camp in there and that just minimizes isolation between us and the community um, for for everyone's security and um, so that that's helped a lot um, we're you know we have really stringent COVID-19 protocols to operate under and, and all of our contractors are doing this and you know knock on wood we've we've operated this project in a drilling mode uh, since August without any you know, COVID uh, uh, outbreak on the project. Um, and so we're vigilant about that. We do extensive testing and quarantine uh, procedures before people come onto the project and then testing when people leave the project and, and that type of thing. So uh, we've been fortunate to continue on and, and obviously our production's a little bit down. We normally get about 1700 meters per month in a, from, a, from a single drill rig. And that's now about 1400 meters. And that's really an effect from COVID, uh, just, you know, slightly slower efficiencies, uh, but that's still really excellent production uh, by any standard. So we're happy with that. Now that we have two rigs on the property, our productivity will jump up to about 2,800 meters per month. Okay. Uh, the next one, kind of a question comment. Uh, you've put out some really nice drill results lately. Any thoughts on why the market hasn't rewarded you for it? Uh, Goldfields clearly seems to like the numbers. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, the, the market has been really volatile. You know, we've, we've hit a high of 80 cents. Um, 
uh, we've hit a low of, um, I don't know what it is, 40, uh, 50, 50, 49, 50 cents or something like that. Uh, we're hanging in there at about uh, 55 to 60 cents uh, these days. I think the, the resource is really going to help. I mean, if anything, I think it's a buying opportunity for people. We're going to have a resource out this year. And I just told you that uh, the potential for this project is 100 million tons of 2% copper equivalent. So it's it's a great opportunity for people to buy right now. If you can buy into a discovery like this with the location that we have, with the $9.3 million in the bank, with a cornerstone investor like Goldfields, I mean, it's just crazy that uh, that that you can buy into Chicana right now at 56 cents, in my opinion. Uh, David, I'll throw in my own question here just as a follow-up. Were you surprised when Goldfields came in and asked to – to bump up their ownership to 19.99 because obviously they mm -hmm. could have chosen to not participate in the financing. Yep. They could have chosen to just maintain their level uh, pro rata. They instead chose to, you know, uh, in what I would view as a vote of confidence clearly to, you know, yeah. to, to up to the maximum. Absolutely, John. I, I'm not surprised at all. Um, you know, they they see the value of what we're doing. I mean, this is a discovery, right? And discoveries are rare. I mean, you go out and go out and find. I mean, real discoveries. I'm not talking about putting a, a, a hole into a, a porphyry prospect with, uh, you know, 0.15% copper and calling that a discovery. I'm talking about a discovery that's based on publishing economic grades of gold, copper, and silver numerous times. We've been doing this since 2017. So again, uh, will these brechophytes be big enough to mine? Absolutely. Um, the mining engineers tell me that. You know, will we will we get a respectable resource in our first go? Yes, we will. Will we continue to expand that? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, if, if, if people, um, you know, are looking for validation, look no further than what Goldfields has done. I mean, the fact that they've come in, they're the seventh largest gold producer in the world. And, you know, they're good at what they do and they're good at spotting opportunities. So I think they're really smart. I think they're doing absolutely the right thing. And, and they've been a great partner for us. So, um, you know, we're, we're really, uh, I, you know, I, I can't control the share price. Um, we can, we can keep our head down and, and advance the project and do good work. Eventually people are going to realize that, you know, this thing is going to be big. And that's, I think that's when, uh, you know, the bandwagon is going to jump on and, and they're going to see, uh, they're going to see this go. But I, I, again, invest now if you want to take advantage of our share price. Okay. Uh, next question from Mark Reichman, and, and there was another question as well from another member, kind of along the same steps. Um, would you please elaborate on the potential for drilling from the underground on the known discoveries, and is any of this already factored into the current drilling program? And then the, the sort of the similar question was, uh, yeah. sorry, David, was just, mm -hmm. will there be any deeper holes this year in search of any source of a breccia? breccia pipe the source for the breccia pipes yeah and i haven't mentioned the fact that we're bringing a third drill rig onto the property because uh because you know we have the money in the bank um it, there's nothing holding us back now um all, the entire north half of the property is permitted so we can drill anywhere we want on the north half and we want to continue the discovery part there's two different types of drilling that we do we do infill drilling and we do uh new target testing or scout drilling uh, exploration drilling, if you want to call it that. And we want to keep both of those going. So our 26,000 meter program that we've approved and we're fully funded for this year is divided into 16,000 meters of infill drilling, moving towards that first resource and 10,000 meters of new target testing. And each target's a little bit different. Sometimes you can test a target with a couple of drill holes. Sometimes it might take three or four or five. Uh, but we think we can test, you know, anywhere from seven to 10 new targets with the, the 10,000 meters and that third drill rig, which is scheduled to come onto the property in, in April. Um, all the drilling we're going to do this year is going to be from surface, but we are going to activate the permitting process to get the underground exploration permit, which would allow for future development to drive uh, tunnels into the breccia pipes at a, you know, three or 400 meter depth below surface. And again, we have topography working in our favor, right? So we can, we can easily get access, underground access to a, to draw, to, to take the resource drilling deeper. Again, we can drill 1200 meter holes from surface. That's not a problem. The problem is, is doing, 
that much drilling to get your resource estimate, the drill density for the deeper extent of the breach pipe. It's much more efficient and it's um, it's much less costly once you get the underground infrastructure built uh, to do the underground exploration drilling or definition drilling uh, from, from, from depth. So that's, you know, we're setting the project up so that if we want to go from the top zero to 300, then you take it from 300 to 600, essentially, doubling the resource and if the breccia pipes are getting bigger you're probably doing even more than doubling the resource on an individual breccia pipe right um so that's a that's a no-brainer way to expand the resource in the future you don't have to find anything new you just have to continue to drill out what you've already found okay uh question sort of around the looking future looking to around, around the mining or randy's asking how structurally sound is the host rock for self-supporting a multiple tunnel system in and around the pipes? Yeah, um, you know, we've not done detailed studies on that, but the mining engineers have commented on that. And there's, there's a few different things we can look at there. First of all, there are multiple uh, mines in the Miocene mineral belt that are hosted in the Kalapui Volcanics, including right next door. We've been underground on the Hercules mine, which is in the Kalapui Volcanics. There's an underground adit on our property that runs, you know, 170 meters. It starts in the wall rock. It goes through a breccia and it goes uh, uh, back into wall rock. And that when we found that adit, um, it was wide open. There is no collapse. Of the of of the of the wall rock or the breccia, the breccia is really well. Um, it's cemented by tourmaline and quartz, so it has a really rigid framework. But when it's heavily mineralized, it's made up of sulfide, sericite, which are really soft minerals. But it's 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 cemented with tourmaline and quartz, and so it's actually a very rigid rock, even though it has a a medium to soft. Um, a hardness profile, and that's just based on doing hardness tests. Uh, but the but the uh, the competency of the wall rock and the breccia is excellent, and you can see that in our core photos. We oftentimes get you know a three meter piece of core that we have to break to put into the core boxes, and you can see that in our core photos. Um, and part of the reason there too is that these are really young breccia pipes. These are only 15 million year old breccia pipe. They have not been beat up. Uh, they've not been structurally de deformed and rotated and faulted and uh, you know dissected and things like that, which you would find in much older mineral systems. Okay. So Randy, I hope that answers your question. Um, the couple questions here, David, around your financing. Uh, were you happy with it? When are you still expecting the second tranche to close? Uh, you know, I believe you announced to the market you were looking for 10 million. You've already got about 7.1 in the uh, in the bank. So yeah, where, where where do things sit with the financing? Uh, yeah, we're real happy with how things have gone. Again, you know, Goldfield stepped up to the plate. They put put 2.9 million in the first tranche uh they're ready to to top up again on the second tranche which uh you know which is active and um you know that that'll it, it'll probably play out in a similar time frame but it's going really well okay and any um i know david i think in in previous discussions that we've had you felt that you know chicano was already fully funded for the drill program this year and the resource estimate mm -hmm. obviously this extra 10 million dollars how is that being allocated then well, we were fully funded for that 15,000 meter drill program, which we were operating with one uh, with one drill rig, and we were, uh, you know, we were, you know, two thirds of the way through that. So, um, you know, this allows us to accelerate and ramp up the program, right? Um, yeah, we're raising a lot of money, and we are we still had 2.3 million in the bank when, you know, just. Uh, a week ago and so we're sitting at 9.3 million right now and you know we'll take in more but we're we're spending that money that money is going in the ground you know we're not sitting on this uh uh we're we're quite happy to to bring a third drill rig onto the property because drilling is what's been really successful on this project the more we drill the more we find and that you know a lot of times in projects the more work you do, the worse they get, right? Uh, oftentimes, 90% of the time when you drill a project on the first go, it fails. There's nothing there or there's nothing there of any significance. So that's reality in this business. The failure rate is huge. It's high. It's 90. Some people say it's 99% for first uh, maiden drill programs on projects. Um, so the odds are against you. So once you have a project that passes that first 
drill program, it goes into the second one, you know, a certain percentage of those fail in the second round and in the third round. Well, we've been drilling since 2017 and the project is getting better. It's still getting better. And that's a really rare thing. It's been very, there have been very few examples of that in my career where the projects get better. And when they do, they, they oftentimes turn into something that 10 years down the road is unrecognizable about since, you know, from your initial view of what you thought that project could be. Okay. Um, a new question just came in from Richard. He's asking, what are the terms of this current financing? Uh, it's all published. I would just refer them to our news release on that. Okay. Uh, what Maybe one last question, uh, David, any significant new investors coming in on this, uh, this financing that, you know, new money to the, to your company? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this seems like a carefully worded answer there. So, all right. Well, uh, I think we'll probably wrap it up. I think most of the other uh, questions that are in the, in the Q&A have kind of been answered uh, more or less. And the, a lot of them were just kind of comments. Uh, people obviously saying big uh, vote of confidence from gold goldfields, et cetera. They obviously see the upside here. So, uh, David, thank you again for attending for your presentation. I, I always uh, find your you know, the project very interesting. And um, uh, maybe we'll take one last question from Mike, Mark Reichman. It just came in. Are you better off drilling on more breccia pipes or going deeper on the known discoveries to prove out your theory, knowing that there are more breaches out there? Would that help marketability? Quick answer. Yeah, that's can. a great question. And, um, you know, I think ideally we want to do both. I, I think, um, you know, you want to advance the project so you're still moving down that pipeline of or that 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 path of of this is going to be a mine someday, and and the more we can do to shore up the resources and to do the engineering studies and to get the underground access is going to advance this to being a mine someday, right? But obviously, uh, we have an interest too, and for our shareholders to maximize the value of what this project can be. And I've been told a number of times, mainly by mining engineers and people that build mines that, you know, the way the way a lot of people would approach this project is they'd get enough resources to build the mine and then they just build it. And they know, you know, you're going to find uh, uh, future resources as you mine. So don't worry about drilling out the deposit, just find enough to get the mine built and then, and then just replenish your reserves over time. And that's certainly, this kind of project is certainly a project that, that could be operated in that kind of way. But, you know, th th like I said, it's so rare to have the opportunity to be sitting on a big mineral system like this. Um, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't get out there and try to figure out how big this thing really could be. And I told you how big we think it could be uh, this, you know, today. And, and you know, it's really that ex that other target testing that is going to, to, to help validate that. Our, our hit rate is huge. I mean, it's very, very high. You know, when we drill targets, they generally turn into mineralized breaches, which we then can drill out. So if we can keep up that hit rate, and we know that we're not, it's not always going to be that high because some of our targets are more, um, uh, they're based on, uh, you know, blind breccia targets with uh, maybe some favorable geochemistry and some good geophysics and that type of thing. And the less, rem uh, the more remote your, your target uh, defining criteria is, oftentimes the, the lower the success rate. Uh, but still, we this is a laboratory for us, right? We can test all of our methods over known breccia pipes. We can apply those methods elsewhere, and we're getting pretty good about figuring out where the mineral uh, mineralized breccia pipes are. So, um, I you know we're, we we want to do both. That's 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 why financing the financing is really important, and we're not going to sit on that. This is not a lifestyle company. Uh, we want to be as aggressive as we can to figure out what we have and and show that to to the world and and uh, people are starting to take notice okay well we'll we'll cut it off here because we are within uh, actually below the five minute window so again thanks again david uh for everyone watching right now there will be when the webinar ends very shortly there will be a survey we we really appreciate if you could fill that out if you want david uh, to contact you or joanne from the company for a follow-up discussion just simply answer yes to that question and we'll make sure they get in touch with you uh coming up next we have Quebec precious metals so you can take the uh you know the few minutes that you have between the next presentation again to grab a snack use the restroom get up for a stretch whatever you like so uh, thanks again David and, and take care
Thank you, John. I really appreciate it.